At the turn of the last century, when the blues was in its formative years, fiddle was among the primary instruments used by rural blacks who were performing in this style. And by 1930, over 50 different African-American blues fiddle players had their work on wax. In many ways, the violin is the ideal blues instrument, closest to the human voice, capable of great passion and able to deal easily with the uncertain and sinuous areas between the notes, all of which are crucial to the blues. Yet by the end of the Depression years, in the mid-1930s, the blues fiddle was virtually a thing of the past, leaving no trace but some dusty old recordings. Why bother then with blues fiddle at all in this day and age? Where are the blues fiddle books, the blues fiddle contests, blues fiddle festivals? There are some, but they're pretty thin on the ground, to put it mildly. True, blues inflections have become central to jazz, rock, country and many other genres of violin playing, but is blues violin itself a thing of the past? Stick with me to the end of this story for the rather surprising answer. The use of slaves in North America began in the mid-17th century on the tobacco plantations of Maryland and Virginia and soon spread throughout the southern states. A highly profitable triangular trade developed. Ships laden with goods sailed from England to West Africa where the goods were exchanged for slaves. They then sailed the Middle Passage to the Caribbean and America, exchanging the slaves for money or more goods before returning to England. Initially, the slave owners sought to prevent music among the slaves. Drumming, which in many West African tribes was a highly developed art, was banned. It was thought that it could be a focus of dissent and rebellion and a medium for passing secret messages. Other forms of music, however, were soon recognised as having the opposite effect, a way of pacifying and placating the slaves. The banjo, based on a group of plucked stringed instruments found in West Africa, quickly became popular on the plantations. It was used as an accompaniment for the singing of semi-improvised songs which the whites found comical. It was clear that the slaves had a good deal of natural music ability and that black musicians could entertain not only their fellows but their masters as well. Thomas Jefferson, in 1784, stated that they are more generally gifted than the whites, with accurate ears for a tune and time, the instrument proper to them is the banjar, which they brought thither from Africa. The owners soon introduced their slaves to European instruments, most notably the violin, which rapidly gained popularity among the slaves. Some would have taught themselves to play the fiddle, but many were also given formal musical training by their masters or learnt in a church or choir. One slaveholder wrote that, I have a good fiddler and keep him well supplied with catgut, and I make it his duty to play for the Negroes every Saturday night until twelve o'clock. By the 18th century, black musicians were playing jigs, reels and fandangos, as well as religious and classical music. In the 1880s, George Washington Cable was able to state, The banjo is not the favourite musical instrument of the Negroes of the southern states of America. Uncle Remus says truly that it is the fiddle. Emancipation in the 1860s did not bring about great improvements to the lot of the southern blacks in America. The Jim Crow segregation laws, the sharecropping system, the all-white unions and the best efforts of the KKK all conspired to keep blacks overworked, underpaid, largely illiterate and virtually disenfranchised. Employment was mostly on cotton farms, in mines or factories or on the railroads. This was the period in which blues began to come together. The chief musical ingredients were as follows. 1. Spirituals, songs reflecting despair and sorrow but looking towards a better life in the next world. 2. Secular songs, more down-to-earth and often humorous songs complaining of or mocking their oppressors. 3. Field hollers, not formal songs and performed in a half-shouted, half-sung technique that was improvised in the fields by the cotton workers. 4. Work songs, similar in function to sea shanties performed by English sailors rowing or hauling ropes. They were repetitive songs with a strong rhythm used to coordinate the efforts of workers and take their minds off the strain and hardship. Such singing was already traditional among Africans working the land in their home countries. These then were the vocal background to the blues. Since the end of slavery, there were now black musicians travelling the south, busking on street corners, playing for dancers or performing in medicine shows. If they were solo, they would often play the banjo or increasingly the guitar to accompany their singing. String bands were also becoming common, where guitar, banjo, fiddle and possibly percussion such as bones would be played. Around 1900, someone discovered how to create melody by blowing into a jug. This became the start of a craze for jug bands in and around Memphis. Performance, both from the string bands and jug bands, would often be accompanied by entertaining and humorous patter. Whilst there was a good deal of crossover with the material and style of the white southern musicians, there were certain distinctive characteristics of the black performers. 
their strong rhythmic sense and ease with which hot, syncopated rhythms were introduced, the ease of improvisation and the bending of notes between a major and a minor modality. It was with the solo singer-guitarist that these elements first came together to form the blues. Many people have drawn parallels between the wandering bluesmen of the late 19th and early 20th century and the griots of West Africa. These were, and still are, musicians who travelled from village to village singing songs, heaping praise or sometimes mockery on their patrons, holding and exchanging the history of the tribes and dispensing some kind of collective wisdom. As well as singing, they played on stringed instruments resembling the banjo or fiddle. They were considered of low caste but were often highly paid and were greatly valued for tribal celebrations of various kinds. In a curious parallel with fiddlers in Europe or America in conflict with the church, the griots of Africa were seen as a threat by Islamic authorities and were sometimes condemned as agents of the devil. They would not be buried in the cemetery but somewhere outside under a baobab tree. Little wonder that links were drawn between this tradition and the legend of Robert Johnson, the wandering Delta blues man who is said to have sold his soul to the devil in exchange for his supernatural musical powers. By the turn of the century, a format was becoming established of songs sung in a standardised format of three lines. The first line is sung over four bars of a major chord, then the same line is repeated, but with the chord changing first to the subdominant and then back to the root. The third and different line concludes the verse, passing from the dominant back to the root. I'm going to leave baby, I ain't going to say goodbye. I'm going to leave baby, I ain't going to say goodbye, but I'll write to you and tell you the reason why. The simplicity and predictability of this structure is its biggest strength, allowing for easy improvisation of lyrics and solos, and easy composition of new songs. The song melody is also simple and mostly pentatonic, but some of the notes, particularly the third, are flattened or bent as the chords change. This bending was mimicked on the guitar by touching the strings, not with the fingers of the left hand, but with something like a penknife blade, or the neck of a bottle, allowing the note to slide. The result was dark, deeply soulful, and to the trained classical ear, utterly bizarre. This was the sound that was to so influence the so-called father of the blues, W.C. Handy. Though the son of freed slaves himself, Handy was educated and a classically trained musician, a cornet player, composer and orchestra leader. He famously describes how in 1903, at a Mississippi railway station, he saw a busker playing blues, bending the notes on the guitar with a penknife. It was, he later said, the weirdest thing I ever heard. He had already been exposed to fiddle music. His grandfather Christopher Brewer had fiddled at plantation dances, and the young Handy had enjoyed doing fiddlesticks while his uncle Whit Walker played fiddle at country frolics. He commented on how in the old times country gals and their mirthful suitors got as much enjoyment out of a fiddle at a breakdown or square dance as jitterbugs or rug cutters get nowadays from a swing band. His own parents were strict churchgoers and disapproved of music for entertainment. When, as a teenager, he bought a guitar and joined a local blues band, he had to keep it a secret. Despite this, he became a professional musician with a travelling minstrel show and eventually became a successful orchestra leader. While by no means an authentic blues performer or innovator himself, his composition Memphis Blues was sensationally successful, shifting 50,000 copies of sheet music within a year. This was the big breakthrough, not just for him, but for blues itself. Here suddenly was a musical style which demanded some respect, not least for commercial reasons. Handy followed up his success with St. Louis Blues, one of the best known of all blues songs. He continued songwriting, publishing and performing throughout the 1920s and 30s and published various blues anthologies. His ensembles always included at least one fiddle, sometimes as many as three. The record industry was quick to jump on the blues bandwagon, signing up many artists for its race labels. Among the performers to record were many fiddle players. Lonnie Johnson was one of the most influential and prolific, cutting over 20 sides for the OK label, starting in 1925. He had already been a professional musician for a decade, having started with his family band, he had played string band music and jazz as well as blues. He performed on both guitar and fiddle, working with a popular band the Mississippi Shakes. Winning a blues contest in St. Louis gave him his big break, the prize being the contract with OK. From here on he concentrated on the blues, working both as a band leader and session man. He was best known as a pioneering virtuoso guitarist, but his violin playing, as heard for example on the Memphis Stomp, is powerful and expressive. Another notable blues guitarist fiddler was Big Bill Brunsey. He was born in a Mississippi plantation in 1898 and was one of the many players who started off with a crude homemade instrument. 
He explained to the song collector, Alan Lomax, Every night I would bring some cornstalks together, and I'd go out in back of the barn and rub them cornstalks together and make music, and the children would dance. That was my cornstalk fiddle. I rubbed it hard when I wanted a loud tone, and I rubbed it easy when I wanted to play soft. From this he moved up to a cigar box fiddle, and eventually a mail-order violin from Sears and Roebuck. To start with, he mostly played music for white audiences, old-time breakdowns and waltzes, but when he moved to Chicago in 1920, there was already a big demand for blues. He took up the guitar and began a long and successful career as a blues singer. Although his dirty, muscular fiddling was heard on some of the early recordings, Brunzi has played little violin since. The blues historian Paul Oliver records having had the rare privilege of hearing Brunzi pick up a fiddle someone had left backstage at a concert in London. During the next few moments, that violin played notes it will never play again. With his powerful fingers twisting, sliding and releasing strings, Big Bill played pure alley fiddle, grinning broadly as the strangely remote sounds filled the room. Another notable blues fiddler was Eddie Anthony, also known as Macon Ed. Like Brunzi and Lonnie Johnson, he had a broad musical background including rags and country stomps as well as blues. A remarkable recording of his is the moaning and groaning blues, where he scrapes and whines on the fiddle along with a song chorus of, as the title suggests, wordless growls and groans from the singer Joshua Pegleg Howell. This is another example of music so intense and bizarre it seems to have come from another planet. Blues fiddle of the period, around 1900 to 1930, can be described as being earthy, energetic and rhythmic. The use of flattened and bent notes and loose and flexible phrasing closely mimic the singing style. It was rarely slick and polished, but often exciting and impassioned. By the early 30s, over 50 different black blues fiddle players had been recorded, but the blues was changing. The hardships of life in the South led many blacks to move north in the 1920s and 30s to cities like Chicago, where there was more chance of factory work and the repression and prejudice were at least less institutionalised. Blues was big in Chicago, but the new style developing there in the nightclubs was loud and heavy, dominated by the newly developed electric guitar, often with piano, harmonica and drums. The fiddle, which had not yet been successfully amplified, had no place in this new sound, and as we've already seen, people like Big Bill Brunzi abandoned the instrument in favour of the guitar. Many black fiddlers in the cities found work in small theatre orchestras, but the advent of recorded music on film, with the release of Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer, put paid to these jobs almost overnight. From being one of the key instruments among black musicians in general, and blues in particular, the fiddle went into rapid decline and virtually disappeared in these fields. For genres such as western swing, country and old-time music, the fiddle remained a potent symbol of the good old days. For the blacks, there were no good old days, and the idea of misty-eyed nostalgia for the early days of the plantations was laughable. Nevertheless, there were a handful of artists who continued with the old style of blues violin into the later 20th century. Howard Armstrong was born in Tennessee in 1903. Nicknamed Louis Bluey, he played mandolin and guitar and was a singer, but also a very accomplished violinist. One of his best-known recordings is Ted's Stomp, a violin instrumental recorded in 1934 for Bluebird Records. He worked with two string bands, the Tennessee Chocolate Drops, and later a trio called Martin, Bogan and Armstrong. His playing was exciting and adventurous, perhaps comparable to that of Stuff Smith, and despite his scratchy tone and shaky vibrato, he was a fearless and exciting player. One of his partners in the Tennessee Chocolate Drops was fiddler Carl Martin. In 1966, Martin was among the four musicians brought together by producer Pete Welding to form the Chicago String Band, an authentic acoustic blues band featuring violin, mandolin, guitar and harmonica. By the 1970s, rock music was in its heyday, and by now amplification for the violin was sufficiently developed that a handful of African-American violinists were able to create successful careers, bringing blues violin up to the end of the century. Papa John Creech, Don Sugarcane Harris and Clarence Gatemouth Brown. Papa John Creech was born John Henry Creech in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania in 1917. He began playing violin in Chicago bars in 1935 and then moved to LA in 1945, making his living playing cabaret spots, ocean liners and occasional film appearances. He described his profession mostly as sawing wood. In 1967 he met rock drummer Joey Covington, who was struck not only by Creech's playing but also by his great gentlemanly charm. The friendship led to Papa John recording and gigging with the band Jefferson Airplane, which later became Jefferson Starship, and the spin-off group Hot Tuna, a much more rootsy blues combo. 
These collaborations lasted from 1970 to 74 and left him with a ready audience for his own blues albums which followed, such as I'm the Fiddleman, The Cat and the Fiddle and perhaps his best work, Papa Blues, released in 1992. He played with a warm, breathy tone, restrained and controlled, but with a rough edge. He often used an aggressive tremolo and had a wide, insistent vibrato. In his solos, a lick would be played repeatedly, punctuated with frequent trills and wild upward swoops. Don Sugarcane Harris from Pasadena, California, was born in 1938 and by his teens was playing R&B guitar and violin with Dewey Terry under the name Don and Dewey. In the 1960s they separated and Harris began to concentrate on electric blues violin. He made many appearances as a sideman with artists such as John Mayle and the Blues Breakers, Johnny Otis, John Lee Hooker and Little Richard. He's probably best remembered, though, for his work with Frank Zappa in the 1970s, notably the grinding, take-no-prisoners, rocking blues, Weasel's Rip My Flesh. Here he makes the most of his raw shredding sound, frequent harmonica trills, tremolo and double stops. His playing can be fast and fluent, but it's most effective on slow numbers, where his distinctive thin tone and shaky vibrato come across as vulnerable and sensitive. Clarence Gatemouth Brown was born in Louisiana but raised in Texas, and the musical influences of both states are clear in his music. Along with the blues, he enjoys playing zydeco, Cajun, swing, country and R&B. Although frequently pigeonholed as a bluesman, and with T-Bone Walker as his biggest single influence, Gatemouth Brown referred to his music as American music, Texas style. He was a highly versatile musician. Alongside the fiddle, he also played a lot of electric guitar, as well as singing and playing some mandolin and harmonica. He was a larger-than-life gregarious character, and I had the good fortune to meet him in the 80s, along with the group I was with, Zumzo. I was giving a workshop on blues and western swing at a British festival. Halfway through, in strode Gatemouth, and with a huge grin, grabbed a fiddle and proceeded to show the audience how the music was really played in Texas. He had been a popular R&B artist in the period 1948-58, to 58, having hits with swinging numbers such as Okie Dokie Stomp and Gates' Salty Blues. His first big break came in 1947 when T-Bone Walker was taken ill during a concert in Houston. Gatemouth stepped onto the stage, grabbed a guitar and went on to steal the show with a number he composed on the spot. The promoter was so pleased he offered him a job right there. After a dry spell in the 60s, his career took off again when in the early 70s he was invited on the first of many tours of Europe where his genial personality won him many friends. He continued to tour extensively up to his death in 2005 collecting a Grammy and a pile of other awards along the way. A fine example of his playing style can be heard on Song for René from his 1983 One More Mile album, also a popular feature of his live set. He plays clean, jazzy lines in unison with the wind section, then launches into a playful solo full of rhythmic excitement. His scratchy, attacking tone is tempered by a very minimal vibrato, but is not short on technique, as demonstrated by the dramatic solo fiddle cadenza which swoops fearlessly up into the high positions. So who is playing blues violin today? There's Ann Harris, based in Chicago, who tours with Blues Music Award winner Otis Taylor. There's Boston-based Ilana Katz Katz, who combines rootsy blues fiddle with old-time Appalachian fiddle. New Yorker Perry Leandro of the Killer Blues Band plays electric and makes great use of effects. Down in Lafayette, Louisiana, is Cedric Watson, who did a fascinating collaboration with Malian singer Babakur Traore, tying together the links between blues and its African origins. Proving that blues is alive and kicking in Europe, singer H.P. Lange's band Big Gumbo operates in Denmark. They have Niels Boniface on violin, and the band has a very cool take on old-time string band blues. But if there's one guy who, for me, shows the very best of what contemporary blues violin can do, it's Lionel Young. If you do nothing else after watching this, check out a video of Lionel Young. Born in New York, he had a high-level classical training, but plays blues with an authority and passion as if he invented it himself. He plays electric with full mastery of effects, and even his pizzicato solos sound like full-on rock guitar. He's worked with Stevie Wonder, Page and Plant, and Count Basie, to name but a few. I have to admit that I cried when I first heard him playing, and believe me, I'm not easily impressed. I asked him whether he thought blues violin had a future. He told me, I believe strongly it has a future. There are so many of us fiddle players. I believe that our numbers are growing. The blues will be here as long as there are people. Maybe beyond that. Mm -hmm. 